Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Future of Work Zoomcast with members of classes, deans, board of directors, uh, board of advisors, I should say. Um, before we get into the broadcast, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. One, uh, uh, this uh, cast is being recorded. Um, and also, uh, and you're all on Zoom. Uh, for any questions you have, please feel free to enter those into the chat box, which I'll be monitoring for later in the program. Um, and with that, I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm Dave Porges, Director of Corporate Relations with University Advancement here at Cal Poly. Uh, I'm also a class board member as well. Uh, I'm also an alum of the school, uh, majored in communications, graduated way back in 86. I'm also a parent of two Cal Poly students. Um, and uh, with that, I would just like to thank all of you for joining the conversation today. Uh, we are very pleased to have our special guests join us for this discussion, which we know you'll enjoy. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our class dean, Dr. Iris Levine, uh, who will say a few words. Dean Levine. Thank you, David, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us for our first event of this kind. Um, the Future of Work is a very important initiative, we know, for our students and for those who are considering, you know, any kind of change of career as well. We, we do know that as we go through our lives, um, many of us do change careers many, many times, actually. But it is the foundation of your learning, the foundation of what you know, those essential skills that are going to help you to find the right positions at the right time for you. I mean, as, you, as you're going on, you might look to do the first few years of your career and then change off to something else when you become excited about a new initiative. And that's great. Um, we also know that those students who have come through um, some of the majors in our particular college wonder, what do I do with my degree? You know, once, once I have completed all of my um, courses and had all those, you know, senior projects and, and, you know, performances and all kinds of things that I have done, what do I really do with my degree? Well, today, you are going to hear from a, a panel of people who have been in your shoes before. They understand what it's like to finish a degree in these particular disciplines and to try to search to find out how do I find my footing in my career options. Um, I'm very excited to be able to have members of our advisory board share their thoughts with you today, led by, of course, our fantastic editor of the Poly Post, Daniela Avila. I can't wait to hear all the things that are going to transpire today. Um, thank you for coming. And David, I'm going to hand this right back over to you. Thank you, Dean Levine. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Daniela Avila. Daniela is editor in chief of the Poly Post and is graduating just in a few weeks. So congratulations, Daniela. Um, I know this is a topic of as much interest to you as it is to the rest of our guests here today. So with that, uh, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you again. Thanks, Dave. I'm so pleased to be with you, our board member guests and our students. Before we meet today's panel, I'd like to thank class and Dean Levine for hosting this event and inviting me to participate. And now to our special guest, Lizette, would you like to share your name, role, company, graduating class year and major? Absolutely, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. It's great um, to be in this virtual space with you all. Um, my name is Lizette Carbajal. I am uh, Vice President of Community Relations at Telemundo 52 Los Angeles, um, which um, for those that may not be familiar is a Spanish language television station serving the Spanish speaking community here in Southern California. And we're also part of the Comcast NBC Universal family. I am a proud Bronco, uh, class of 2001. My major was communications with a PR emphasis and a minor in marketing. Very cool. Jamar, why don't we have you go next? Hi, my name is Jamar um, Boyd Weatherby. I am, um, I um, graduated in 2000 with a degree in philosophy. After graduating from Cal Poly, um, I went on to UC Berkeley for law school, and, um, and I currently work at Jones & Mayer. I represent cities and municipalities 
um, focusing on labor and employment issues. Nice. Ira, can we go ahead and have you go next? Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. My name is Ira Pemstein. I am the supervisory archivist at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, also proud Bronco in 2001 uh, in anthropology and history. That's great. Okay, and for Peter, why don't we go ahead and have you share your name, role, and connection to CTP. Hi, I'm Peter Yates. Uh, I've been at Cal Poly in various ways since 1981, when I was here part-time for one day teaching one class uh, as a lecturer. And then I just retired in, uh, in December after, as chair of music, uh, where I had been teaching full-time for many years as well. I teach also at UCLA in the music department, and I'm very happy to chip in on behalf of the arts and that version of reality here. It's good to be here. Great. Great, and thank you so much. It's so great to hear about all of your backgrounds. And we're so thankful that you're here to share your knowledge and experiences with us. So here's our first question for all of you. Reflecting on how your industry has evolved over time, what attributes and or skill sets do you anticipate employers will be looking for from young professionals in the future? Lizette, why don't you start it off? So from um, an industry perspective, so I work in the media space, um, which we think it's no mystery that the media space is evolving almost every day with a variety of you know, new platforms being introduced. And so I think um, from you know, attributes, there's a few that I would share. One is um, be a forever student. Just because you're graduated doesn't mean that we don't need to learn anymore. Um, you know, this pandemic has taught us not only here at the station, but I think just industry wide that we needed to reimagine and reinvent, right, the ways that we were connecting with our audiences. Um, from a community perspective, for example, um, you know, we didn't have the ability to do in person events anymore. So we had to look at what are the Telemundo platforms that are available. How do we connect viewers with resources and information and really maximize right, the following that we have? Um, linear television is, is changing, right? Now we offer digicasts, you know, we have a, a mobile app that we have to you know, live stream some of our, um, create new content to be streamed. So in terms of from a media perspective in that industry, it has, it's constantly changing and we have to continuously you know, fine tune, add new tools to our toolbox. And so I think as a professional, you'll, that, that's something that will be constant throughout your entire career is, is learning and, and adapting and being flexible, right? Looking outside of what your job description is to expand your knowledge base, to gain new experiences and really stretch yourself. Um, I, I don't want to, um, I, I want to bold and highlight the value of communication whether it's writing, um, communicating verbally, um, especially in our industry, words are really important. Understanding who your audience is and how those words affect and impact them is really important. I mean, we see that from, you know, how we tell stories on air to how we write our press releases um, around initiatives that, that are serving our community and our viewers. So I think um, continuously, you know, really working on those communication skills that will carry you through, you know, in any position and in industry that you're in. Um, the other piece is relationships. Um, I, I, you can't underestimate the power of relationships. And I'm not saying transactionally, but really put in the time to cultivate and, um, and build relationships. Um, I think over the course of your career and you know my experiences is um, how you interact with people, how you come, you know, when you're working on projects, sometimes they're challenging projects, but it can be even more challenging if you don't have those relationships in place to be able to bring people along with you to get to you know achieve your goals and, and objectives. And so really investing in those relationships along your entire career um, from You'll be surprised the, the relationships that you've made in college will 
will be relationships that you'll cultivate throughout your, your, your professional experience and will oftentimes be sounding boards for you um, as you, as you continue. So I'll, I'll stop there. I can go on and on, but, but really I, I think um, Dr. Living, Dean Levine said it best in the beginning is, is those um, essential skills. Sometimes they're quoted as soft skills I, it, there really are essential skills and it's, it's the, the building, the knowing how to work with people, the, the knowing how to communicate, understanding your audience and, and really continuing continuous learning. Right. And I completely agree. Those are great skills to have. Jamar, do you have anything to add to that? Yes. Um, from my industry, I think that, or like the, the legal profession in general, one of the things that's really important is having a transferable skill. So if you learn some area of specialization, if you're going to be a litigator, you're going to be able to do something that that ultimately gives you value and gives the like gives your company value. I think it's a good way to advance and protect your advancing your career in actually have a feeling of uh, kind of accomplishment and direction. The second thing, and this is like specific to kind of the modern attorney, like post COVID, I think that what, um, to piggyback on what was just said, networking and being able to talk to your peers, even virtually or figure out how to talk to your peers, um, because what, what has been cut out with, um, with Zoom calls and things of that nature is the one-on-one -on -one interaction and the uh, uh, learning over lunch and learning how to, like, you know, do certain motions or how to interact with certain judges or whatever the issue is, that has basically been eliminated. So the, the challenge that I, I don't envy you guys for is to figure out how to do it. And um, and like and in what space you you'll ultimately do it. I don't know if it's going to be over Zoom or there's going to have to be much more proactive engagement with your your colleagues. Um, that may be even spread out um, over the state or the country. But uh, um, I think that that is kind of the, the 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 biggest challenge right now. Right. Absolutely. Learning how to adapt. Right. Right. Ira, I would love to hear what you think. This is a great question. Um, you know, for decades and decades, a, a person who was interested in um, library slash museum field, um, and this is going to apply a little bit more to the library side of things because that's my area of expertise, but also works on for museums. It's also the case with museums as well. You know, you you have to be you're a very uh, detailed, organized person. Um, you would get your degree in one of the social sciences or humanities. History and art history are the most common, but any of the any of the social sciences or arts would would would, would work. Um, and then you'd go on um, and get an advanced degree in maybe in library science or museum studies. And then or else you could stay within your chosen discipline and become what we call a, a subject area specialist. And then maybe do a couple internships and then you you would be qualified and, and, and ready to go. The issue right. is that again, for decades and decades, research institutions like myself, where I work at, again, followed a very similar pattern. And that is, okay, we have these rare books and primary sources and all this cool stuff. And if you wanna come and see them and utilize them, you, you have to come to us, okay? And that's great if you live in Southern California. It becomes a little bit more difficult if you live out of the state or out of the country. For years and years and years, it would be very common during the summer, we would have four or five professors, scholars, graduate students who would you know, raise the funds, either their apartment would help them out or they would get a grant or pay for themselves and they would come to Simi Valley and spend two, three months at the library doing research, you know, on their own. But the public started saying several years ago, started saying, we don't, we don't want to come to you anymore. We want, we want you to come to us. And then the time they stopped asking and started demanding, we want you to come to us. Um, 
it's referred to as doing research in your slippers. People don't want to leave their house to be able to do their uh, to be able to, to do research. So the the traditional skills and the foundation, which are still quite important for somebody who wants to go into libraries or museums, that 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 foundation is still essential. But now a whole new world opened that we needed to be able to adapt to. Because you have to, a library has to have patrons. A law firm has to have clients, a TV station has to have viewers, and a library has to have patrons. Because if not, then we're in trouble. So we have to learn to adapt to what the public needs. So all of a sudden, things like database management, web coding, digitization technologies, all these things became essential skills that we needed to learn so that we could maintain uh, and, and keep our researchers um engaged and, and occupied um so you know one of the great things is is you don't know what the future is going to bring and you don't know what skills you know what's going to happen and how things are going to change over time um, and what you're going to have to adapt to you know if i had a position today to fill at the, uh, at the library and i had a i had two candidates one had a, a phd from harvard in history which is a wonderful thing, you know, and then I have several people with PhDs on my on my staff. But somebody with a PhD from Harvard versus somebody with maybe a master's degree from any university, but they have all those skills that we need, the technical skills that we need, person with a master's degree is probably gonna get the job. And I think that's very reassuring to hear, especially for our students here today. Peter, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, of course, I'll try to keep it short and try to uh, tweak it towards music and performing arts since that's my area. First, in terms of reassurance, I always like to tell students that, you know, having been doing this for centuries, starting as a student, uh, I've noticed that people I went to school with and my own students over time kind of end up where I thought they would in terms of the appropriateness of what they do. Music uh, that I do, you know, in my field, is huge and varied. Uh, I always laugh when we call it the music industry because it seems like an oxymoron. We don't have like pots of boiling uh, steel or anything, but it, it has a lot of aspects. And uh, the Dean mentioned changing careers. And I think that what goes on if the students have uh, the right skill set is partly their own determination to shift what they do towards without, sometimes without realizing it towards what really suits them and what they had originally in mind. And I've seen that again and again in the arts where, you know, when you're a student, you think, my God, I'll end up in the gutter, but I haven't seen that happen. Uh, everybody seems to be doing well and doing kind of appropriate things to what I thought of them when I was a kid, you know, when they were in school. Um, another funny thing about the whole technological progress is that, uh, you know, art is non-progressive. People don't get more artistic or more talented in music, and yet you have this whole apparatus that keeps evolving that you have to juggle with. So keeping your perspective and knowing yourself and what success would mean like to you is critical. In music, I think of it as, okay, who's your audience and what do you think that you need as an audience? Because we have this foggy idea that we want to be famous and, you know, world revered. But that's not really what most people want. So, uh, you know, years can go by and then you can realize, you know, really what makes me happy is working with a few others and who understand what I'm doing and vice versa. And I don't need a huge audience. So that should be something to think about early because you can save a lot of time not trying to you know, conquer the world in a more general sense. If what you're suited to is more particular, there's great freedom in that, you know. If you, if you don't need a, an enormous audience, then you can do what you want to do more. Um, then people uh, mentioned uh, skills about relationships and so forth. And let me just pitch in for the performing arts as a last comment for now, saying that uh, in the performing arts, you learn, learn about good stress and bad stress and the difference between them. Uh, bad stress would be being a couch potato all day and not having anything to do. You know, No stress at all is bad stress. Uh, so it's too much stress that's unremitting. But in the performing arts, uh, and I count law in this as well, <laughs> uh, 
you, you uh, there's good stress. You, there's an objective, like the concert. You get really paranoid and nervous about it. You work hard. You do the concert. You feel great. You go out and have a beer. It's over. Uh, or you play one note. You have to stress and relax. So uh, I think that skill of managing stress and understanding its good and its bad aspects is something that students can get in the, in the college. I, I completely agree. And thank you for sharing your insights. For our next question, this is specifically for Ira and Jamar. This pandemic has made us all adapt to change in ways we had never imagined. As new CPP graduates entering the workforce, what would be your advice, particularly on how to adapt and navigate during this particular time? Ira, we can go ahead and go with you first. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, you know, this pandemic has just really uh, blown things up. And, you know, one of the things I've really learned to appreciate about my um, education and time at, at, at Cal Poly was, um, and, and really even in our, in our college in class, is the, is the building of not only your analytical skills, but your creative skills. Because... I mean, if you would have come to me, you know, six months before the pandemic started and said, you know, you're going to have to maintain doing what you've been doing, but you or none of your staff can actually go to the library campus and utilize any of the resources there. Um, I would have told you that's impossible. Forget about it. Go home. The bar's open, right? Um, but then it became the point where, you know, we didn't have an option. We had to we had to figure out a way to go on, and you know, again, library is a science, and again, you, you know, you it's very, you know, A plus B equals C. Well, you know, in this environment, A plus B doesn't equal C. So, you know, we had to bring in, we had to bring in strategies, and and ideas and technologies that we never would have thought of before to do. And again, this is all having to tap into this creative side um th that you have you know um working with other institutions using social media um using secondary sources more often again just you know other ideas that at the time didn't seem possible and really another really important thing was that you can't you can't do these kind of things by yourself you need you need to be you know, you need other input, you need a team, you know. I would get, you know, I got together with my staff, other professionals in the area, and listen. You know, one of the things I, I cannot stress enough is the importance of listening. You know, as old saying, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, All right? Listening to other ideas and making the, the, the decision is, is, is paramount, you know. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, you know, is I think people need to prepare themselves um, if you've never done remote work before. Um, I truly believe that this pandemic is going to change the working world uh, to some degree. I mean, every industry is different, you know, on how it'll be. But, you know, people who tell her, if some people adapt to it very well, they can get a lot accomplished. They can get very co-focused. There's, there's no distractions. Some people have a really hard time with it. Some people have a hard time because there's too many distractions, right? Your kids are, kids are crying in the background. Dog wants to go for a walk. You know, you kind of look over the TV. You know, what's streaming on Netflix today? You know, and they have a hard time adjusting. And I think for the new graduates, you know, you need to prepare. It's a, it's a, it's a self-discipline. That you have to that you have to have to be able to be successful with the telework, and again, I think in in some degree that this is going to be the new norm moving forward. Right, definitely. Jamar, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, th I think that like to piggyback on what what I said and what everybody else has said so far about like kind of the like kind of the post COVID world. Um, I think that one of the things that's going to be important is to be flexible and like, and also flexible in the ability to identify opportunity. 
So there's going to be new areas of law that are generated for in my field, new areas of law or hyper specialization. Like last year, um, a little bit before this time, um, I didn't wasn't really um, very focused on cattle OSHA regulations on like regulating the safety of 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 businesses and you know and facilities. Now I'm a subject matter expert in that in that area where that is ultimately again what it, um, what it, what was said earlier is kind of a transferable skill. There are other opportunities in other um, sectors where you know like somebody being COVID compliant. Um, is a big deal in also just trying to anticipate the direction of where law is going to go and what are going to be the patterns for employers. Um, one of the big ones right now is that, you know, like with vaccinations, you know, are there going to be some kind of pullback for um, all of the protections that workers are getting? So like, are you not going to get workers comp anymore if you're vaccinated or if you don't does choose not to be vaccinated, do you get, do you not get workers comp or do you get the COVID time and things along those lines? So just trying to be flexible in both your approach to um, your job, but in, in anticipating what's going to happen next, but also look at the market and identify where there's going to be room for, you know, growth or to make money, not to be an ambulance chaser, but, you know, like if that's what works, that's what works, you know, you know don't hate the player, hate the game kind of thing. So the, um, that is the, like, the thing that I would be like, kind of, I would advocate for, um, for, for new graduates. Right, definitely. And you're right, we all have goals to pay, right? <laughs> but thank you for sharing. Our next question is gonna be specific to Liz Lizette and Peter. So based on your experiences, how would you suggest students approach becoming more involved civically in their communities and why is this work important? Lizette, we can start with you. So the, um, this is a great question. Um, in my particular profession, that is my responsibility. So I get um, to do and focus on the things that matter within our, our community and what's important to our audience. Um, service is important. I mean, it's, it is, it just, it's critical. Um, giving back, understanding from a service perspective also for us in, in my field is um, being connected to nonprofit organizations that are addressing the issues that are impacting our Spanish speaking communities are critical. So having, having those inroads with organizations to understand that the work that they're doing at the grassroots level. Um, I'll give you an example. At the start of the pandemic, for example, um, my focus is to ensure that we connect resources um, to our Spanish speaking community to highlight issues, to bring them information so that they can take um, actions and make decisions on um, issues that are impacting them daily. But we were seeing at the start of the pandemic, for example, when all the distance learning started happening and kids um, needed to be at home was the impact was um, uneven, if you will, right? So, you now had um, Spanish speaking families that had their kids home 100% of the time, were now asked to have a Zoom account, have email, all of these things that were, um, I think uh, people assumed that you, know, you knew how to do that or that people had emails. So you have to also take a step back and say, no, the, the, they didn't have an electronic identity. They didn't understand what email was. How do you open Zoom? Why do you need my information? What is my information going to be used for? All those sorts of things that are important that the only way you know how to, you know, from, from my position standpoint, understand what those impacts are, were to be connected with those organizations that were doing the work. So in my particular role, it, it is really important um, to, to be civically engaged, to be informed, to understand how you can be an ally, how you can be an advocate, and how you can be active. Um, the other piece, I think, just from a professional um, standpoint also is, you know, forums like this where we can give back and impart some of, you know, our, you know, lived experience or what we've, you know, um, 
you know, learned throughout our, our personal and professional career thus far. And if that helps open a door or uh, make the path um, to connect a little easier for a future generation, that's really important. Um, so I, I think community service is, is, is critically important, understanding um, your role in the big picture, right? And what you can do to, to add value, to, to create connections and understanding is, is important. Right, absolutely. Peter, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Well, let me tilt it towards, again, performing arts because it might have something interesting to add since I agree with Lisette that uh, what we're doing in the arts is agrees with what she's talking about, which is a kind of service, giving back and paying forward. For example, if you give a performance, you don't really know for sure uh, what people thought of it. You know, they're, they'll applaud or cheer or something, but that's just what people do. It's very rare that you get any real input that it changed someone's life, for example. But what you're doing is you're modeling what an experience you may have had years ago was like, and you're paying it forward. So, you know, those years ago, did you really go backstage and grab the performer by the lapels and say, you changed my life? No, you went home and you were excited. So it's all based on a kind of faith of contribution to the culture. Um, one of the, it's nice to have a mission in what you do uh, when you're talking about working civically, that you are nurturing a culture, you're adding things that are missing. I call them missing vitamins. Uh, when we study in uh, the College of Letters, Arts, Social Sciences, we're learning about other places and other times. And the reason we're not playing, for example, we're not playing music of the past because we're necrophiliacs. We're playing it because it has something going on there that just doesn't happen to be on TV right now. Sorry, Lizette, you'll have to fix that. Uh, but, you know, there'll be some character to it that's in each of us that isn't represented by our time and place. The uh, a, a productive way of thinking is to realize that the individual is much broader in potential than any particular uh, society will happen to be providing at that moment. So what we can do when we interact with society is add those missing vitamins. And you learn this by studying other places, other times, other languages, what, what college is like. So going forward, you want to just double down on that. I read an article once where someone had the idea to interview a hotelier in Paris. And he asked the guy, oh, well, you know, you've run this hotel for a while. What are the, what are the different clientele like? And the guy thought for a moment, and then he started, he talked about his stereotype of every nationality coming in. He said, well, you know, the Germans, they want everything clean, you know, and then he say, uh, uh, and he said, uh, the Brazilians, now the Brazilians are easily tactile and they're looking for a poetic experience. And I thought, that's interesting. And then the guy said, well, what about Americans? He said, they want luxury and Wi-Fi. <laughs> so that taught me something that even though people are the same, their cultures at any given moment are not all doing the same thing. And in the arts, you know, gee, it would be nice if we could get a little of that Brazil thing going on about poetic experience as a goal in life. That's kind of cool. So that's what I mean by vis missing vitamins and understanding the local in terms of the general. So uh, what you what you want to give back locally is has to be informed by a broad perspective about people and what makes a good life. Right. Absolutely. And I think it's important to note that there's there's so many different avenues and ways to give back. There's not just one single way. Look at these two different industries and the impact that you both have, you know, on the people that you're serving. So thank you for sharing. Our next question is for everybody, but Jamar, we'll go ahead and start with you first. When it came to planning your future career, what is some advice you wish you could have given your younger self? Um, if I, I think to not be rigid about the, the thing, but also kind of to identify what my definition of success is. Because when you come out of law school or you come out of whatever your graduate program is, what ends up happening is that you get trapped in whatever everybody else is doing. And success means you make partner and that you drive at least, um, you know, 
a certain series Mercedes, if not like a higher luxury car, and you have to live in certain neighborhoods. And I think that that definition of success creates really interesting pressures on your career. And uh, um, in that you end up doing things and living a life that may or may not be consistent with what you value and like what you actually want to do. So like when I came out of law school, I thought that I wanted to do um, success to me was to work in on the West Side and do entertainment law. And uh, um, and I did it for two and a half years. And I was miserable. I, like I didn't like it at all. And uh, um, you know, like I felt bad about the fact that I was driving a Mazda six two six. And you know, like there was and like in everybody else seemed to have Bentleys around me. That that like created a like kind of a different pressure on my career. And like and from that, I think what I got was, you know, kind of to step back and define what you know success is for me. Success is. Um, being having the ability to travel and be able to have flexibility in like when and where I work. So the the pandemic hasn't changed my um, my day to day much because I've always worked from like home or wherever my my clients my clients are cities. So I always went to them anyway. And cities didn't shut down simply because of the pandemic. But what that has meant is that you know like that flexibility means that you know like on Monday. I was in Miami and, you know, last week I was in um, Curacao um, for, you know, for the, the weekend and like I was working in Curacao for the weekend, but like, you know, I can mix up where I work, where um, the only place I've been to 77 countries, I have only place I didn't work was Cuba and that's because they didn't have Wi-Fi and that <laughs> was, um, <laughs> And that is that there's a downside to what I just said, but that also like that matches my definition of success and like in kind of kind of directing how I approach life and, you know, like in, in what works for me. It may not work for everybody. Some people just may want to have, you know, a certain amount in their bank account or drive a certain car, but that's success is like flexibility and, you know, identifying what it is that I want to do more than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. It's about painting the life that you want to live, right? right. <laughs> Ira, I would love to hear what you have to say about this. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I, I actually went to Cal Poly at, at um, two different times. So I was, uh, I was a student from 1988 to 1991 and left for various reasons and, and came back in 2000 to finish. So I would love to just talk to my 1988 version of myself. And, you know, I would say, don't be in a hurry. You know, I understand, you know, people have uh, financial constraints and time constraints, you know, but I remember when I was in school and, and all my friends who are, you know, who I had back then, everybody was in a hurry. We've got to get done. You got to get out. And you know, if you think about it, if you're in your early or mid 20s right now, you have 40, maybe even 50 years to work. So take this time, you know, fully immerse yourself academically and socially in the, in, the, in the progress, you know? And the other thing I would have told myself, or I would like to have told myself, is to follow your passions do what you love you know you can make a living you can make a living doing what you love it may be in a way that you don't know or haven't heard of but it's out there if you dedicate yourself to it you know part of the reasons one of the reasons i left in 91 is because i you know i became frustrated that i didn't see a i didn't see a career path for myself and i thought i i would be better off in the working world on my own. And the truth of the matter was, I just really hadn't fully, you know, immersed myself in, in the process and really saw what was out there. Now, granted, this was, in, this was before Google and the internet, so it was a little harder to do things, but, you know, um, and it's not that I have any regrets, but, you know, I wish I would have taken the time, you know, when I was younger to really see what was out there and what career opportunities there were. Um, I never would have thought 20, 30 years ago, I'd be doing what I'm doing today. Right. Hey, 
okay. And I think a lot of us are in that, that same game right now, but thank you for sharing. Lizette, what do you have to say about this? Um, I think it's similar to, to what's been said is the, um, if I were to talk to my younger, my younger self, I think there was a lot of really self-imposed pressure to just get things done, get things done and have the job and have the, you know, and it was, it was, life is not that defined. And, you know, what's that saying? If you, you make plans, what, you know, God laughs at them because they, there's certain opportunities that open other doors or that, um, you know, uh, open your, your mind to going a different path that maybe you had not planned for yourself. And so I think it's just, having that open, you know, being open-minded to the fact that where you started and what you thought, you know, the path was going to be may not necessarily be where, where you end up. And that's okay because along the way you start to discover the things that you're really passionate about, the values that you have and starting to um, discover that, you know, you can find work that aligns with your values, right? If you're, you know, if, if you want to, to, to be in public service, right? There, there's a path for you, or um, you know that, or if you if you want to be in the corporate world and still find a, a way, you know, find that nexus of your your values and getting your pay, the, the pay piece of it, you can find that. Um, but it takes time, also. So um, that instant, you know, I graduated. Here's my degree, and this is the job I want. It isn't that clear cut. And I think when you're younger, you think that. It's that automatic, well, I graduated, so I should be at this level going in. And it doesn't often work that way. And that doesn't mean that it is that you're not successful. It just means that you know you have opportunities to continue to learn. Um, and those will help shape um, the direction that you want to take. So I think it's it's really just being open-minded um, to Jamar's point, less rigid um, and just being flexible that that you know the you'll get there. Um, but where, where, where you were from a mind, you know, state of mind at, you know, let's say 21, 22, 23, whatever, you know, age you are graduating and in, in, in your early twenties is going to be very different <laughs> when you're in four in your forties. So just have that flexibility and that grace, um, so that you, you can navigate that. Right. I completely agree with that. I especially think that so much changes from when we first started our, um, our careers, our collegiate careers to now that we're graduating. You know, I think that some of us might even be changing um, our perspectives about what we want to do once we graduate. But Peter, I would love to hear what, what advice you would give to yourself. Um, I kind of followed my advice, actually. Um, it would, just was more important than I realized. Uh, I, I like the comments people made about defining your own success, being aware of how that works. Uh, nowadays, there's a great primacy that we've mentioned, and it's a good thing of working in teams, but some people work very well alone or very less frequently with others. And it's good to get a sense of that in yourself, how that works, what balance you want there. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that the job and the career, we've mentioned changing them. They're not everything, you know. Um, there's more to life than your career. And the idea that it should exactly satisfy all of your needs is a little bit unrealistic. So what you want is a productive uh, interaction. I think it's just as important when you're in school to keep your private work going. You know, as creative people, most people have the work they want to do. They're practicing, they're composing, they're performing. You know, they're studying Beethoven in school, but maybe they're playing in a rock band on the weekend, you know, that's fine. Keep that going. It's very healthy. Keep that, just keep playing, whatever that means to you. As musicians, we know what it means. Keep playing. When you see the people who don't play anymore, I don't care what their job is, then you realize, hey, that, that person needed to have kept playing. Maybe they can get back into it. It's hard. But anyway, balance your personal time in your work. Um, I've had students who decided in the end, you know, one guy, brilliant musician, brilliant, he got a master's degree at UCLA in performance, but he decided based on what his interests were that he was going to stick to the family trade. The family trade was this window washing concern where they washed big buildings. 
But the deal was he could get as much money as he wanted any old time. It was like a money tree. He would go and he'd work and he'd get the money and then he'd go off and do what he wanted and he could schedule his own time. It turned out to be, for him, perfect solution. Uh, and others might be a substitute teacher and then they, they play in, at night, you know. So in, that's something to consider. It doesn't, it's not a bad thing necessarily, but you got to know. Um, in my line of work, a lot of people go into teaching, but it's, one of the things you want to find out quick is, do you like to teach? Because some people say, no, I don't. Okay, so well, that's going to determine a lot to know that up front. Um, I would say beware of entertainment. It's kind of a waste of time. If you want to be creative and you're in the arts because you have a feeling for life-changing events, then entertainment is not really maybe uh, where you want to be because it just puts you back where you were when you started. It doesn't change your life. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but it does mean it's kind of inert. Um, so when I, got, I could talk about more, but we all have surplus time. And your art is what you do with it. It's up to you. Uh, and I'm not really even trying to say one thing is good and one thing is bad. I'm just saying you got to think about what your goals are and suit it to that. Uh, and you can get on a thread that follows your through your life that's very satisfying if you're in the arts or the sciences, you know. Yeah, and that was very inspirational. <laughs> Thank you for that. But for our final question, this one's going to be for everybody. What is your favorite CPP memory? And secondly, what is some advice or words of wisdom that have served you well throughout your career or additional inspiration you like to share with students entering into the workforce during this time? We can go ahead and start with Lizette. Thanks. Um, so <laughs> oddly enough, and I actually saw this in, in Cal Poly's Instagram yesterday, I missed the tram. <laughs> Just gonna say that for those that, that were around when the tram was around, um, I, you know, I I had a I I really did enjoy my time at Cal Poly. I'll be honest with you, and um, you know, not only from um, you know the the social aspect of the fact that a lot of the friendships I have now um, are from Cal Poly, um, but also from you know the, the sort of academic and and the experience I had you know within within class was was incredible. I mean, Dr. Jane Ballinger was is is someone that I I still you know stay in touch with and and I feel helped kind of shape you know um, and open my eyes into the the communication field. So um, those are those are wonderful um, memories and I mean I can go on and on but yeah I had to throw the tram in there because I, I I did enjoy the tram. Um, in terms of advice, um, there are a few things. Um, I, one is um, you never know who your boss is going to be. So again, going back to the relationships and how you interact with others, it's really important because you really, you really don't know. Um, someone who is your peer or even your junior at some point in your career could be your superior one day. <laughs> Um, the other piece is um, I had a director when I spent some time at, at, at SoCal Gas who was really um, adamant in, um, and he used to always say it started every meeting with be here now, be present, you know, and so if you are have been invited to to have a seat at the table, don't lose the seat at the table, be present, contribute. Um, understand and, and, you know, kind of make that, that connection with, you know, your, your lived experience and your voice, you know, it, it matters. And if you were invited to be there, you know, contribute. Um, and, and so, but the be, the be here now is really important. Um, it, when, when you look at it from a, you know, that been in the corporate spaces, um, you have a lot of people taking time to make very important decisions about business, about projects, and you need to be engaged and you need to contribute. So um, those are just a few things. Right. I completely agree. And thank you for sharing that. Jamar, what about you? Um, I, it's hard to identify like my favorite. Actually, it is in heart. Like I, I, when I was at Cal Poly, I did um, Model UN. I did. I played basketball while I was at Cal Poly. But by far, my favorite experience um, is um, spending time in the philosophy department and just talking to the professors. 
um, Dr. Miles, Judy Miles, she's not, she's no longer at the, uh, the department, but um, Dr. Turner, Dr. Adams, there are so many people that, um, that it was that informal learning that, um, that was invaluable in that. And, and ultimately I felt that it, it influenced me in ways that is even hard to quantify as far as how I like to have conversations. I mean, this sometimes becomes problems and, you know, like my relationships when I was just like, well, what do you mean by that word? But, um, but ultimately this is like, it is probably one of the highlights in life as far as like kind of like engaging and feeling like, you know, very intellectually engaged. As far as the advice, um, I think that what I would advise, I would advise that, you know, to, just to, to try to be as flexible, again, flexible with like kind of your approach and in, into your career, but also just kind of identify what makes you tick and like and kind of looking internally and to, to identify what it is that like makes you happy and through that happiness then kind of um go from there to, to try not to be you know pulled in a thousand directions at the same time um where you're not fully you're not doing anything well because you're you're trying to um be everywhere i think it's probably what that what i would advise Definitely. And it's that, that journey to self-discovery we're all looking for. Right. Ira, I would love to hear your favorite memory and some advice that you have as well. I love to tell this story. You know, um, when I when I decided uh, to come back uh, in 2000 and, and finish finish my degree, you know, it was it was it was a, it was a tough decision, you know, because my life had moved on and I was married and had a family and you know, but I had this emptiness that I hadn't finished my degree. And, you know, I reached out to some faculty. Um, one of them was uh, D.D. Wells, who I see is on the call with us today, who was very encouraging for me to come back. Um, and I'll never forget my first day after nine years being away to campus. I had an eight o'clock class. And I remember I got to campus um, early because uh, I was worried about parking. I started, I got out of my car, started walking towards building five and everything, everything felt the same. Everything felt natural, familiar, you know. Um, I saw some of the food had changed, which was nice. And I got inside building five and I walked up to my classroom and I got to the door and there was one one guy sitting in the, in the room at the time. And he was just, he was, you know, the only guy I call him, he was just, he was just a dude. You know, he was just, he didn't look very interested in being there. He looked maybe like he's kind of hung over, you know, and he's kind of like, yeah. And I, for some reason, I just got engulfed in sheer terror. I said, what, what am I doing here? I'm, you know, I'm 30 years old. I need to be, I need to be home. I have a mortgage to pay. I, 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 my time in college is over. You know, I had my chance and I really was going to turn around and walk away. And I poked my head in the classroom and I saw sitting in the back uh, was a lady. She had to be in her seventies easily. And she looked up at me and she smiled and she went back to reading her book. And then all of a sudden, the terror went away. And I was like, okay, okay. It's gonna be me and you, kid. If you're here and you can do it, then I'm gonna do it, you know? And that was the best decision I made because I never looked back since then. You know, so advice I would give is don't quit. Don't ever quit, you know? Life is tough. Things don't always work out the way we plan them. There are setbacks, there are frustrations. But, you know, again, one of the great things about Cal Poly is we all, we all have that skill set and the training to succeed. And, and, and you need to trust in that and believe in that and believe in yourselves. And if it doesn't work out the first time, the second or third time, it will. 
you know, just don't ever give up on what you want to be and what you want to do. It will happen. Thank you for sharing that story. Peter, would you like to share? Uh, sure. My, um, I'm thinking back to what Lisette said about be here now. That's a, I, I'm, I'm down with that. I, so for me, my favorite Cal Poly experience is this one as it's developing as a memory right now. Um, I like what Jamar had to set up, say about flexibility. It made me think of music again, that uh, flexibility is a kind of strength as, as we probably know. My father was a, a, a physiologist and I asked him one day, I, because you know, music, there's an, a pretty close relationship between the tempo of the beat and the tempo of the human heart in terms of the range that they can occupy from, you know, down there, 40 beats per minute, all the way up to you're at the top of the hill on your bike and it's going boom, 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 180. So I was interested in that. And I said, Dad, how steady is the human heart rate when you're at rest? Because we know that the resting, everybody has an average resting heart rate. And he said, oh man, if it's too steady, you're gonna die. That's a sign of morbidity. It needs to be flexible, hovering about a certain value. I thought, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So that's why metronomes breathe death into the music, you see. Um, I thought about staying creative, what Ira was mentioning. And when it comes to be the goal again, there's a lot of ways we can be here now and be present that have to do with what we're after. You know, the French say, what are we waiting for to be happy? So it's really important as you move forward to have this blended view, like when you play a note in music, you just played a previous note and you're playing this one in terms of it, but you're also anticipating the next one. It's all three at once. So when you're thinking about your big old future and how important it is, don't forget about today and what is happening right now that you can contribute to and make into something good. Um, you know, for example, the two acceptable public behaviors in the United States are earning money and spending money. You know, we have laws against loitering, for example. And if you're on vacation, you better be headed to a hotel or you're in trouble. You know, just being there is not really something that people are encouraged to do. So appreciation, wonder, contemplation. Ira was talking about, you know, taking advantage of those things in school. But that's absolutely right. Also go forward and realize, be here now with those things. Appreciation, wonder, and contemplation. They're not exactly front page news. <laughs> so if you're not reminding yourself of them, who's going to do that for you? That would be my advice. Right. Thank you for sharing. Peter, I would have loved to have taken one of your classes. <laughs> but <Hey>. this concludes. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> but this concludes our discussion for now. But now we'd like to hear from our students. So Dave, did we have any questions from our audience? Yes, we do. We have a few of them actually, right. and, the, and we'll just leave, right. open this up to anyone uh, who would like to answer on the panel. Um, first, it says, thank you panelists, this is great. It concerns me that the work, that work has a common definition limited to employment or jobs. There's a lot of work that people want to do that is not necessarily a job, such as cleaning up the environment, working with indigenous people, uh, or organizing communities to address, dish, address issues. Um, there is a lot of jobs out there that are not essential or rewarding, um, and this is the speaker, how do we address this problem in our conception of work? And I think it lies somewhere between um, the idea of uh, following your, your passion and staying open to discovery, but I'll let the panelists sort of hone in on this. Again, there's a, there's a lot of work being done out there. It doesn't necessarily classify itself as quote unquote a job, but um, could it be made into a job to where again, there's alignment with someone's passion. So I'll just leave it at that. And, and anyone who would like to comment on this, uh, uh, this uh, statement would be great to hear. I can, I'll, I'll start off. Um, I think that the definition of work even you know, like for, for, for state law is much broader than like whether or not you're receiving payment for it. 
And I think the you shouldn't be restrained from doing whatever it is that you that you want to do in that you if you want to work with indigenous communities you want to help clean up the environment all of these things you can dedicate yourself as long as you're able to like live and you know you have you know the essentials food clothing shelter um and on some level then i think that that, that there shouldn't be any limitation on you pursuing that. And that's the ultimately what you find valuable in that that, that kind of gives you that gives you drive. Now the, the curiosity, personally, I don't think I could I could dedicate myself entirely to like one of those those projects because I, I ultimately need to be able to do other things I want to do, travel, so on and so forth, that require money. But that's that's a personal decision, but that's not something that is I'm like per se, um, you're not limited in that um, with your degree or like you kind of a, your future approach. Thank you, Jamar. Anyone else would like to comment on this? Well, I think, you know, I, I just want to think back on what I'm saying, you know, it, it, really, it really depends on your emphasis, mm -hmm. on your definition of success. And, um, you know, you could, you could have all the money in the world and, but if you're doing something that your heart's not into, then you're not going to, you know, you're, you're just not going to be a, a satisfied person, you know, um, you know, I've all, I, I found, even though it took me a little longer, follow, you know, just, just following you, I found a way to make a living following my passion, you know, and, um, could have made more doing something else, but wouldn't want to. Wouldn't want to. I'll just I'll just add um on on to that is that I think um there is work in those spaces. There's a lot of nonprofit organizations that are dedicated to work on a variety of issues. The part that I think um, Jamar also mentioned and, and so did Ira is where you have to ask yourself is the value of the type of lifestyle you want to have, right? Because the, the pay portion of it, which I know, you know, is, is something that, that is important, right? Is, you know, nonprofit work. Um, you can do communications work in a nonprofit that aligns with the value of, of the, the giving back portion on a specific issue that you want, um, but it's not as competitive as, that same position in a corporate environment. So I think you also have to ask yourself like what your your where you're putting the value. But if your drive is to do that work, there are organizations that you can align yourself with that you can even start volunteering at today um, to understand what that work looks like. What does it look? What is it? What is the experience working in a nonprofit organization? Um, what types of positions are available? Um, but yeah, of course, right? The, the pay portion of it um, is always something that you have to ask yourself in what, what industries are competitive and in, in what spaces, right? The lack, of, the lack of pay is really uh, useful in assessing what you're really doing. Um, so, and there's a, there's a volunteer component, nonprofit component to every job. You come to work and you've got your job, but there's other things you bring that make it better that you're not intrinsically paid for, that you can make a huge difference in your work environment as well, as well as ancillary sideline gigs and volunteers that I'm totally into also. And then there's a third category, which is, you know, house cleaning, working in the yard, maintaining, taking care of kids, this sort of thing that I, I think that if you want to enjoy anything in life, the more you... Uh, the more you take care of it, the more you enjoy it. So I'm not a big believer in having a lot, you know, big staff of people to hire to clean my house or take care of kids or something. If you want to value something, you take care of it. And that's where the value comes in. So there's so many aspects to what that, of that question, but I think that the, the so-called nonprofit aspect of everything that we do is, is huge in terms of life satisfaction. Yeah, and I would add to to the nonprofit opportunity and pathway. It's there's a public sector pathway for a number of these things. Uh, great jobs within local, state, federal world uh, aimed at some of these issues. 
And then also in the foundation world, the private, public, family foundation world, a lot of great work being done to um, minimize the impacts on these, these issues. So it's a big world and it's a complex world and, and it's a, a great place and a great time actually to be doing a lot of this. If you were to ask some of these questions maybe 30, 40 years ago, we might've been a little bit more, uh, um, you know, less positive about it, but a lot of these issues, there's, there's a tremendous framework being built around all of them. Uh, another question, uh, which I I'd love your thoughts on, what is the most efficient way in your experience to get your foot in the door with any organization uh, as a recent graduate? So a, a practical question. <laughs> It, okay, I, I will answer the, the practical question and also circle back to the previous question too. Okay. Um, so one of the things that like has tremendous value in the law, it's even almost I think any of the industries, is that if you get experience as a litigator or as whatever, but it's it can be, your experience doesn't have to be paid. Like you can ultimately, if you can go work for a nonprofit or any of the, uh, the, the, the things that drive you and you learn how to you do class actions, you know how to do a class action, whether or not it's working for the, the nonprofit or that sector, or if you're doing a class action against, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, like an NGO or, or, or some kind of major, major conglomerate. So the value is that you can bring in your experience um, and try to go get the experience where you want to work and then like segue that into um, learning and meeting different people in the, in, in the fields that you, that you, that you, you ultimately want to work in. Like my, my current job, um, when I was, I, I worked as a public defender after working at the big law firm, and um, and one of the, the the people who I went against um, was one of the partners at my firm, and they, he thought I did good job, good work, and like, and they made me a, a job offer based upon how I interacted with that person. Um, I've done the same thing is if somebody is impressive to me and they, they seem like they have the skill sets that would be necessary, um, then I, we try to pull them in whether or not they have the experience per se, they have the experience that like they have transferable skills that all we need to do is fill in a few more blanks. So that's the, the I guess, my big advice on that point. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, Dwayne, I mean, that's so great. I mean, experience is 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 really key, you know. Um, uh, in my area, you know, take the time, you know, volunteer at a small historical society or small museum. These these places have no funds. They love, they need the help. You know, any type, any type of internship or experience you can have will help you to will definitely help you to stand out. And you know, and even if you can't get uh, internship or something like that, you know, it, we do so. I do this all the time. It's, it's called job shadowing, and that's just uh, a, spending a day, half a day, with somebody in in uh, a professional in the in the area you're you're uh, interested in, and just getting a feel for what day to day life is like. That can be you just that one day or even half a day can can make a tremendous difference because you'll really understand, you know, uh, what what. You, you know you'd be getting yourself into and if you're not so sure you know it'd, it'd be a good way to uh, a good way to learn but even that like the job shadowing is, is, is really helpful that's great ira thank you other thoughts on uh the most efficient way for graduates new 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 graduates to get their foot in the door in other organization in any organization i should say um, I'll, I'll add, I mean, it's really more echoing. I think um, it, one is there's a lot of volunteer opportunities. Um, so I think making those connections, for example, you know, once we're, we're back in person, um, we would do huge health fairs and we're always looking for volunteers. And guess what? Those are great opportunities where it's all hands on deck. So you have 
every level of the organization present. So, I mean, really, and that's just an example, but when you're looking at ways to connect with, you know, somewhere where it was, you know, the industry you want to be in or the company you want to work for or the organization, um, there's always volunteer opportunities, which will allow you to make those connections. Um, and then not only from the connection standpoint, but it also exposes you to, you know, what you thought it was going to be versus what it is. Um, and maybe there's a disconnect there, then then that says, okay, well, maybe that's, that's not, you know, the, the, you know, where the route I want to go. So um, right now, there's so many organizations, um, to David's point, that are doing really great work that you can volunteer in this environment today and gain some of those, um, start building some of that, that network. Um, so there's a lot of value, value there. Just one small word. Uh, I, there are various ways in which the written word and being able to express your thoughts in writing, perhaps even only in an email follow-up or something like that, can make you stand out once you've had that chance to have it be read. Uh, there's, that can make a big difference, not only how you say it, but also what you say. Um, so thinking about that and keeping track of your attempts to represent yourself in writing, uh, you know, keeping every pitch letter or thank you letter you've ever written in, in a file so you can improve them and work on them, not as a kind of slick thing, but as, to actually get to what it is that you are and being able to communicate that clearly uh, in good language that seems useful to your potential employer in other ways, uh, I think is still relevant. Thank you, Peter. And before I turn it back to Daniela for the close, uh, I would just add to this, you know, start with your network early. Um, I, to this day, get outreach from students who want to uh, join certain organizations. And, uh, you know, if I don't know someone within those organizations, I might know someone who knows someone. So, you know, you have to think about bank shots, you know, like in the game of pool, you know, you may not be able to get directly in, but you might know someone who can get you there. Um, and that, that, you know, LinkedIn ties to this, the platform LinkedIn ties in this, but that's another conversation. So, uh, Daniela, I will turn it back to you. And uh, before I go, thank you to everybody. Thanks for everyone who attended. And Danielle, thanks so much for your engagement too. It was awesome. Yes, of course. And thank you so much to our amazing class advisory board members, Lizette, Jamar, Ira, and Peter. We greatly appreciate your time and your insights that you've shared. So let's show them our appreciation. And thank you to all of my fellow students who joined us today. It was a pleasure to be a part of this and I hope that you all have a great weekend. <laughs>